1 Peter chapter 1, our text this morning is actually going to be verse 15 and 16, but I want to read from verse 13 and make some comments on these before we get into our text. But notice as we begin here in verse uh, 13, and again, this is our third message in this chapter. We're not doing a verse by verse. We've done that years ago, but there's just a few subjects I wanted to pull out of here. We've talked about our eternal inheritance in verse 3 through 5, and we've talked last week about Christ's sufferings and His glory. I'm going to title the message this morning, taking the title from verse 15 and 16, Be Ye Holy. He said here in verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee for this wonderful day that You've given us. We thank You for the privilege to be able to come into Thy house with Thy people of like precious faith. Lord, we pray for Your blessings, Your anointing to be upon the reading of Scripture. And Lord, we pray that You would speak to us uh, from Thy Word and by Thy Spirit. We thank You. We love You. And again, we thank You for this opportunity. For it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Uh, Amen. Now notice as we come back, and we're going to get into verse 15 and 16 in just a moment. But as we come here uh, and, and we think about this, and I've preached a number of messages on the holiness of God and, and holiness in general, and every time uh, I, I think, well, I'm going to be doing something quite different and I do something similar because when I think about holiness, I like to emphasize the holiness of God and then, secondly, the holiness of God's people. Now what is interesting, we find here in verse 15 and 16, I will make this comment on these verses before we get started, we find here that he says that God is holy, and he says, be ye holy. Now that's an interesting uh, text when we look at it. Our text has both the holiness of God and the holiness of God's people. And if we cannot be holy, then why would God say for us to be holy? And so uh, we find that we can, through the grace of God and through the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that it is possible. Now, our text speaks again of the holiness of God and the holiness of His people. This uh, book was written about 64 A.D., Second uh, Peter's written about 66 A.D., and the church was going through much persecution. I made mention of this the last two weeks. Uh, verses 6 through 8 speaks of the trying of their faith. And they're going through great persecution. Every chapter in this uh, book here, five chapters, has got a section in it that's dealing with the persecution. In chapter 2, I've mentioned this in the last couple of weeks, verse 19 through 24. Chapter 3, verse 14 through 18. Chapter um, 4, verse 1, and also verses 12 through 19. And then again, chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. And so we find that they were going through persecution, and yet, going through severe persecution, uh, Peter's writing to them after speaking of the wonderful things that they have in Christ, and he's telling them in the midst of their persecution that they are to live a holy life. In other words, that is our vocation, that is our calling, whether good times or bad times, that we are to be holy. Now notice in verse 13, he begins with the word, wherefore. Uh, He's basically, what he's doing here, and I'm not going to go back and read the first uh, 12 verses, but he begins here in view of the great blessings that we've been talking about the last two weeks our eternal inheritance reserved in heaven, and Christ's death and and sufferings for us, and all of these wonderful things that he said, again, that we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks. He begins here now in verse 13, and he says, Wherefore, 
Again, this is in view uh, of uh, all the blessings that we have. This is in view of the great salvation, the glorious privileges and hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And he's been comforting, comforting them in the first 12 verses. And now he's going to exhort them. He's comforted them with truth that we have in Jesus Christ. And now he's going to, um, uh, he's going to exhort them and tell them uh, in some things that, he, uh, that they're to do. And uh, we're going to come back next week, I think, and look at verse uh, 17 uh, about sojourning. But notice now, he said in verse 13, he said, Wherefore gird up thy loins uh, of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You say, what in the world does all of that mean? Well, he's talking about girding up the loins of our mind. And uh, there actually is a double metaphor that's given to us here, the word gird and the word loins. Uh, We're to gird up the loins of our minds. And he's talking about we're to be resolved in our thinking, uh, in our hearts and our mind about what he's uh, getting ready to say here. And when we come through the Scripture, and I'm I'm not going to ask you to turn to any of these, But I give you an example. In Exodus 12, when the children of Israel was coming out of Egypt, uh, the Lord told them in verse 11, He said, And thus shall you eat it, speaking of the Passover, and your loins girded, and He says, And your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. They're getting ready to after the Passover, to leave Egypt, head toward the Red Sea, and into toward the Promised Land. We find that even uh, the Lord told Elijah uh, this. He girded up himself, and he was able to run a long distance. We find uh, uh, this was told to Job in chapter 38 and in verse uh, uh, 3. Uh, the Lord had to set Job down and uh, explain some things to him. He basically said, Where was thou when I created or laid the foundations of the earth? And he just went through a list of questions with Job and, uh, and teaching Job some things that are very important. But he told him the same thing. You know, gird up thyself, gird up thy loins, physically speaking. Here in our text, it's speaking, uh, and it's a figure of speech that he's using here. But I uh, just wanted to give you some examples. In Luke 12, 35 and 36, a servant would do this. We find that Jesus Christ, the night before his crucifixion, what did he do? He, after they uh, had, um, uh, had uh, the Passover together and, and so forth, he took a towel and girded himself. He wrapped that towel around him, and he washed the disciples' uh, feet. And again, this is used many times in the Scripture. Ephesians 6.14 says uh, to the saints of God, as Paul closes that letter, he said, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. So what are we looking at here? We're looking, when he says here in verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind... Let me just stop there, because and wherefore gird up the loins of your mind. This is a figure of speech. He's using this in a spiritual um, uh, area, and uh, to to um, it's based upon the gathering up of a long garment and uh, and 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 wrapping it around you, tying it around you, um, uh, tucking it in, and so forth, so that an individual could do certain activities. Elijah did this when he was running. Uh, He ran for a long distance. And also, uh, people would do this uh, maybe when they're working and or when they were in battle or something. And what men wore, as we come through the Scriptures, we find that women, uh, they wore dresses. The Bible's pretty clear in that. And the long flowing garments and so forth. Men, the Bible actually uses the word breeches. And men wore breeches, but also a lot of times they would their uh, their top part would hang down past their waist, you know, a little lower 
their loins and their waist. And so when they would get into some type of activity, they would gird that up or girt that up. And uh, in other words, they would wrap it to where that it would not be in their way if they were running, if they were working, or if they were fighting in a battle or so forth. And so when, when he says this here, and again, um, he says, Wherefore, gird up the, uh, the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, and this implies readiness and earnest preparation for duty is what it implies. Uh, bracing up, in other words, pulling ourselves together, spiritually speaking. The word gird means to bind, and the word girdle uh, is that which binds, like a belt or a band or whatever. I've said for many years, you know, to, to people, and they'll look at you real funny. I, I said, man, tighten up your girdle and let's get with it. You know, let's get this thing done. And they said, I don't wear girdles. Well, you do. You've got a belt on or a band around you or something. And so, so that's what he's talking about here in this passage. And it's, it's a strong uh, resolve of the mind that is meant here in this passage. So now look at it again. He said, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind... And the second thing that he says is be sober. He's talking about spiritual sobriety. Self-restraint is what he's talking about. You see, he's, in, he's been comforting them from verses 1 through 12 and just showing them all the blessings that they have in Jesus Christ. And this is the way God writes his Bible. He'll tell you who you are and what you have and all of that first. And then he'll tell you, said, okay, now let me show you how to live according to that. Amen. And so this is what Peter is doing here. And he, again, he's talking about spiritual sobriety. And, uh, and you'll find this again in chapter 4, 7, and 5, 8, and in many other places. Sometimes, uh, most of the time, you'll find the word sober, it is referring to in a spiritual manner. Well, notice he also says, uh, and, and he speaks of our hope. Now, we found that hope. We preached on that in chapter uh, here in 1, verses 3, 4, and 5. Uh, that inheritance that is reserved for us, that eternal inheritance and the hope uh, that we have again in verse 3, 4, and 5. And so, notice in verse 13 again, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your, mi of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now notice with me in verse 14. In verse 14. In other words, he's talking about their hope that they're not to faint, they're not to become weary in the trials and the tribulations that they're going through. Stay focused on eternity while we live upon this earth. And, uh, and he's just trying to encourage them in this way. We find that uh, there's some things that abide. There's, the, there's some things that come and go, you know. But there's some things, uh, according to 1 Corinthians 13, 13, that abide, and that is faith and hope and charity. That's the last verse of that chapter. So these are things that are, that are enduring, and they will abide with us. Now notice with me as we come to verse 14. He said in verse 14, as obedient children. I've always thought that was interesting as to what he refers to them. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance. Obedient children, conducting themselves as becoming the, the saints of God, obeying His commandments, and being submitted to His will is what He's saying to them. And then in verse, uh, the latter part of verse 14, uh, He says, "...not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance." In other words, don't, uh, He's talking about being conformed, not allowing ourselves uh, to be conformed to, the, to this world or to our former conversation. And so that's what He's trying to get across. Now let's get into our verses. That's just an introduction. Let's get into our verses and notice in verse 15 and 16 again. 
And again, I want to talk a little bit this morning about the holiness of God. I, I, every, every time that I deal with this subject, uh, I just this is what I'm drawn to. It's to point out God's holiness and then to point out the holiness of His people. But notice he said in verse 15, and we're going to turn away from this in just a moment, but notice in verse 15 and 16, well, let's take verse 15 first of all and make a comment on it. He said in verse 15, But as he which hath called you is holy. You know that this is a calling? We have been called into this. We have been called into salvation. We've been called as to be saints according to Romans chapter 1. But we're also called to be holy. In other words, this is our life's goal. To be like God. To be more like God. And, uh, and so it's a calling that He's placed upon us. That He's given to us. So He said in verse 15, But as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now God wouldn't have said this if it couldn't be done. Now I want you to, I want you to think about that. If, you know, I've had people say, well, there, there's no way we can be holy, we can be right, and so forth. Well, God said that we can. And this is all done, again, through Jesus Christ. And, but He said here in this passage, He said uh, in verse 15, But as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. This is why that I'm loving going through the book of Proverbs. I'm learning. You, you have to listen to it for an hour. I spend eight hours in it. Every sermon that I preach, I spend at least eight hours uh, on it. And so uh, uh, Proverbs talks a lot about our conversation. Conversation in the Bible can have to do with our words. It also can have to do with our conduct. It can be either one or both. So we find here that uh, we have a calling, we have a vocation, and it should be our lives go. We are called to be holy because God is holy. Is that, is that clear? I hope that's clear to everybody. Now notice verse 16. In verse 16, you say, what is holiness? Well, it's the state of being holy, purity of heart, sanctified affections, Okay, sanctified affections. Let me say that again. It has to do with piety. It has to do with moral goodness and to be separated unto God. In other words, we are to be devoted to God. You, we could find many more synonyms, but those are just a few. It's a state of being holy, holiness, uh, purity of heart, sanctified affections. In other words, our affections, our conversation, our hearts are to be sanctified. And uh, so, so we see, see these principles throughout the Holy Scripture. But in verse 16, he makes this uh, statement. He said, because it is written. So God's talked about this before. In other words, he told his covenant people in the Old Testament to be holy. And he's told his covenant people in the New Testament, as we are here this morning, to be holy. And he says, you can do this. He says, I'm holy, and uh, you're to be holy. Now, I'll show you in a few moments that holiness is one of God's attributes that he can share with us. There's attributes that he cannot share with us. But this is one attribute that he can share with his people. So he says in verse 16, he said, because it is written. You'll find that written down in Leviticus 11.44. And he'll say something else about that in verse 45 and 47 of the same chapter. And what is interesting is that when you um, look at the passage back there, speaking to his covenant people of the Old Testament, the verse was taken out of the Old Testament in reference to Israel's separation from, from unclean meats. I've always thought that was fascinating that Peter would take a passage out of that text, Leviticus chapter 11, and bring it into the New Testament and speak of holiness. Now, notice with me as we turn, I want you to turn with me to Exodus 
chapter 15 and notice here. So we have the statement that God is holy. We have the fact that God says to you and I that we are to be holy. So we know that those two things are a reality. Now notice as we come to Exodus chapter 15, I mentioned Israel a moment ago, uh, girding up their loins, getting ready to leave Egypt. They uh, partook of the Passover and God carried them through the Red Sea. And here we're, we're going to be reading really the first song that we actually see in the Bible uh, begins in verse 1. But I want to, first of all, I want to read verse 11. And I want you to notice here, I want to establish the fact that God is holy. Now, we've already seen the statement in First Peter. As a matter of fact, God is called the Holy One uh, who is free from defilement and sin. And what is interesting, He is called the Holy One about 55 times in the Bible. And 25 of those times, I believe it's 25 of those times, are in the book of Isaiah. It's either 25 or 29, but there's, there's a lot of, in the book of Isaiah. Now, do we really think about the holiness of God? I mean, when you're sitting around by yourself or, or sometimes talking to others, do you really think about the holiness of God? He's without sin, without defilement pure and holy. Notice in verse 11 of the book of Exodus, and it says here, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? In other words, we see here, glorious in holiness. There is no one like him uh, that, that has ever existed. And uh, he's glorious in holiness. Again, this is the song that the children of Israel sang uh, as they came out of uh, Egypt, Moses' song of gratitude. It said in verse 1 and 2, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength. And song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. He goes through this chapter, at least part of this chapter, uh, with this song and praising the Lord. He said in verse 18, The Lord shall reign forever and ever. And then we find in verse 20 and 21 that Miriam and some of the other women in the congregation there that they sang and praised God because of this glorious triumph. I want you to turn with me to Isaiah, and notice with me in Isaiah chapter 57. In Isaiah chapter 57. Now I'm going to read as many verses as we can, and I'm going to just refer to some of the verses. In Isaiah 6, we, we was in that passage a few weeks ago. I'll not turn there, but I'll make mention of it. Uh, one of the reasons I asked that this hymn be sung before that we started the service. Holy, holy, holy. When we read in Isaiah 6, uh, we find that, um, that uh, Isaiah's vision, it's his vision that he got from God. And uh, the, king, the king had died, the earthly king, Uzziah. He had died. And there was a lot of mourning that was taking place during that time. And God gave a vision to uh, Isaiah and encouraged him. Uh, he had a commission uh, to go and to minister and to preach. And, and God encouraged him. And God let him know that the earthly throne was vacated, but the heavenly throne was not vacated. And he clearly, and, and he uses the expression, holy, 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 in the passage there. You'll find the, this expression again in Revelation 4, 8. Holy, holy, holy. And the context of God and His throne. What is interesting, in Revelation 4, the throne of God is mentioned nine times. And as you read through the book of Revelation, 
it's mentioned about 30 times. In Revelation 4, they're worshiping God. And they cry out. The beasts that are mentioned there, uh, the angelic beings, are, they're crying out, Holy, holy, holy to the Lord God. Notice now as we come here to the book of Isaiah chapter 57. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read one verse. I guess it's been earlier this year, last year, I preached an entire message from this verse. And uh, I kind of got wrapped up in this uh, one week and couldn't, couldn't get away from it. But I want you to notice, I'm going to read it first, and then uh, I want to make a uh, couple of comments on it. You see, when we talk about God's holiness, the holiness of God speaks of His attributes really all put together. In other words, when we talk about His love, which is an attribute, His love is holy. His name is holy. And we find that His mercy is holy. And we find that even His anger and wrath is holy. That's not true with us. The wrath of man does not bring forth the righteousness of God. And so every, everything about the Lord, so we, could, we could take this subject of holiness, and again, it's, it would speak of all of His attributes put together. Because every attribute of God, God is holy in them. His love, His mercy, His wrath, all that God does, He is holy. Holiness is what sets God apart from all others. And we, as we said a moment ago, He is separate and distinct even from His own creation. And the nature and character of God is holy as we come to the Scripture. And that's why that we ought to have reverence uh, in our private devotions and prayer. We ought to have reverence when we talk about the Lord. We ought to, we ought to have reverence when we come into the house of God. Why? Because our God is holy. Now notice as we read in Psalms 57 and in verse 15. Now look at this. He said this. We're going to find here His name. I'm sorry, Isaiah. Isaiah, stay where you're at. Yeah. Notice in verse 15, my wife says one time, she said, um, if you ever give a reference and then you get to talk and you give another one, she, she told somebody in church that stay with the one He gave you the first time. <laughs> the second one will be wrong. <laughs> Isaiah 57:15. We find here that God's name is holy. Now look at this. He said in verse 15, and we broke this verse down again when we preached the message on it. And he says here, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy places with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now, I want you to think about this. God's name is holy. He is holy. Everything about Him is holy. Okay, There's no sin, no defilement, no discrepancy, or whatever with God. But one of the reasons I preached an entire message on this is because God is dwelling in in two places in this verse. You'll find, first of all, it said, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. Notice that he said, I dwell in the high and holy places. He's in what we probably could call the third heaven. Uh, the Bible mentions three heavens in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And... Uh, and, and we're not, and the earth is in atmosphere is included in that, and then, of course, the Lord is, is, is a place you can't get a spaceship to. And, uh, but uh, he, this is where he dwells. But notice in the middle of this verse, he says this he says, with him also. I had to underline that word also. So that would jump out, highlight that. He said, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, that is lowliness of mind, and to revive the heart of the contrite, that is the broken one. 
broken over sin and rebellion and things of that nature. So God dwells in the high and holy places, but God also dwells in the heart of His people. And that, that's the promise that we have. He dwells in the heart of the contrite and humble spirit. And, uh, and so He dwells in the heart of those who are truly born again. Turn with me to the book of Psalms now. Psalms 29. One of the Psalms that we just sang a couple of weeks ago. Notice in Psalms uh, 29. Another verse you can write down, Psalms 145, verse 17, says the Lord is righteous in all His ways and holy in all His works. We serve a holy and a righteous God. Now, notice as we come here, and we're going to, we're going to read this, and then we're going to get into the thought of uh, us being holy before a right, uh, righteous and a holy God. You know, I've had people over the years... Um, whether it be their temper, their anger, their conversation, words they shouldn't use, and whatever. I've had people tell me, well, this is the way I am. I've had preachers tell me that. This is who I am. This is the way that I am. This is the way my daddy was, or my mama was, or my relatives was, or whatever. In other words, I got a, my short fuse. This is who I am. This is, this is what I inherited. This is in my DNA. And my question is always, what have you got from God? Amen. What have we got from God? We only use excuses sometimes with language and attitudes and anger and, and bitterness and so forth. Well, God changes us. Amen. And then He says, be ye holy. He, he gives us a positional holiness and then He asks us to work on a practical holiness. So notice in chapter 29, then we're going to go to the New Testament and spend the rest of the time there. In chapter 29, I'm going to read the first two verses. And again, we sing this psalm. And uh, notice in verse 1 and 2, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength, give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The beauty of holiness here speaks of a holy beauty. And in our text, it speaks of the presence of God in His sanctuary. We find His temple mentioned in, uh, in verse uh, 9, and Him as King in verse 10, and Him as Lord in, again in verse 11. We find His majesty is full, full of majesty and power in verse 4. So what we have here, we, have a whole, we find that holiness, now think about this, holiness is beautiful in God Himself, but it's also beautiful in God's people. This is the beauty that we need to wear. This is a psalm of praise, a call to adoration and worship God. And the Bible speaks of holiness in terms of beauty and contrast to the ugliness of sin. So we have here the beauty of holiness. We got an entire message titled that too. And uh, I think that's what we titled the psalm as well. You know what David is doing here? This is a psalm of David. And David is singing to the Lord. He's singing unto the Lord in this psalm. And he, and, and he talks about worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. This is David's meditation on the holiness of God Almighty. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, please. In the book of Hebrews in chapter 10. Now let's talk about the holiness of God's people. And I know most of these verses are very familiar to you, but let's talk about these. Now I'm going to be reading in Hebrews 10. I'm going to come down and read verse 14 first of all, then back up just a few verses. But let me give you a couple quotes. Um, one writer says, Man's holiness is now his greatest happiness, 
And in heaven, man's greatest happiness will be his perfect holiness. Thomas Brooks. Another man made this statement. He said, the holy person is the only contented man in the world. And then I want to read this. Spurgeon said this back in the 1800s. He said, Christ will be master of the heart and sin must be mortified. If you live, let me back up, if your life is unholy, then your heart is unchanged and you are an unsaved person. The Savior will sanctify His people, renew them, give them a hatred for sin and a love for holiness, the grace that does not make a man better than others is a worthless counterfeit. Christ saves His people, not in their sins, but from their sins. And then He says, without holiness, no man shall see God. It's taken from Hebrews 12 that we'll read in just a moment. So, when we think about the holiness of God's people, again, if it cannot be done, why did God say to do it? He told us to be holy. So it can be done. And holiness, again, is one of God's attributes that He shares with us through the Lord Jesus Christ who makes us holy. Now, there is a positional holiness, so like sanctification. There's a positional sanctification, which is a similar word. It means to be set apart. And there's a positional aspect of this that you've got to get right in your mind before you talk about the practical. Yes, amen. Now notice, I'm going to read verse 14, then back up to verse 10 and read all of them together. Verse 14, he said, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now think about that statement. By one offering, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, He hath perfected, He's perfected them that are sanctified. Sanctified, again, is real closely associated with holiness. And it means to set apart from the world unto God. So we have a positional sanctification, we have a positional holiness through the new birth, through conversion. Now let's read from verse 10. Notice in verse 10, and this positional holiness, by the way, begins with salvation. It begins the day that someone is converted. Someone is saved. Someone is born again. That's when the positional sanctification or holiness begins. And you have to be born again to have that and to be saved and enter into heaven. So he says in verse 10, he said, By the which will we are sanctified, there's that word again, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He said in verse 11, Every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, referring to Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 14 again, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So we have, to begin with, and must talk about this verse, we have a positional sanctification. That's what we have in Christ by being a Christian. But what we want to talk about, too, is a practical sanctification. Because he says to those who are, who are saved, Be ye holy, because I am holy. Notice in Hebrews 12. In Hebrews 12, one verse. I'm going to read verse 14. So holiness is both instant and progressive. It begins in the heart... And it works its way out, affecting the entire life. That's why the Apostle Paul told the Philippians that in chapter 1 and verse 6, that God, what God has started and put in my own words, He will perform. 
In other words, he, he will continue it. And he also says in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, I believe it is, he said to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's not saying to work for your salvation, work out what God has put within us. So, the holiness that we're talking about is instant and progressive. Now, notice as we come here to chapter 12 and verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So we have the positional sanctification and the practical sanctification. Positional holiness begins at conversion, salvation, new birth, and the practical holiness is we're to follow and pursue all of our Christian life. Now notice in Ephesians, notice in Ephesians 1, In Ephesians 1, Paul writing to this uh, church, here's what he says uh, in verse um, 4. Now he calls them faithful in Christ Jesus in verse 1. But in verse 4, he said, According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be what? Holy. That we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Now notice as we come to chapter 4. Come to chapter 4 and notice here. We just read this a week or two ago also. I don't remember where it's in Proverbs or Sunday night, but we just recently read it. But notice here, and you'll find the same uh, statements, just put in a few different words in Colossians 3, verses 8, 9, and 10. But I want to read from verse chapter 4, verse 22 through 24, and I challenge you to read the rest of the chapter this evening sometimes, and also read Colossians, the entire chapter with it. Now I want you to notice as we come here, when we talk about now practical holiness, he said, be ye holy, there's some things that we're to put on, and there's some things that we're to put off. So he begins in verse 22, and he said that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man... That is, our old nature, the lusts and desires that we inherited from Adam. He said, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So there's some things that we're to put off. We're not to talk the way we used to talk. We're not to have uh, affections the way we used to have. There's to be changes. And then he said in verse 23, he said, and be renewed in the spirit notice of your mind. So there's that renewal that takes place in the person that's truly born again. So this is how that we can be holy because we have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit living within us. And through the work of Jesus Christ, he's, He'll give us the power to walk and live holy before Him. Amen. Notice verse 24. He said that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And then he goes through a list of things to do and not do. So this is very important that we understand this. When God says, be ye holy, we can be holy, but it's through Christ, it's through what He's accomplished for it, and it's through the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Turn to a really good passage on this second Corinthians chapter 7. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, reading in verse 1. I'm going to read verse 1, then I'm going to back up into chapter 6 and read a few verses. But notice with me in verse 1. He said here in verse 1, "...having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit." Notice, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's a command that's given to us as Christians. And so, when he says here, in in the latter part of it, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, he's referring to the fact that we are to be making progress in our Christian life. 
Every day we're to be making progress, draw, drawing closer and closer to our Lord and Savior. That, that, that's a part of being holy. Notice as we back up into chapter 6 and just kind of get the context, because he, he mentions promises in verse 7, having these promises. Well, notice in chapter 6, and verse, beginning in verse 14, "...be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord, that is, that which is common... What concord has Christ with Belial, that's Satan, or what uh, part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 17 Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Then verse 18, he says this, And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So, that's the promises that we read about. And then in chapter 7, 1, he tells us clearly, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We're to grow in the things of God. Well, notice with me in Romans 6. In the book of Romans in chapter 6. Now, without reading the whole chapter, I'm going to begin in verse 11. This chapter is similar to what Peter is doing in 1 Peter 1. The first ten verses is telling you what you have in Christ. Telling you who you are and what Christ has accomplished for us. Then he begins in verse 11 to tell them how to live according to their position that they have in Christ. Notice as we come to Romans 6 and verse 11. He said, Likewise, in other words, count it to be so. The truth that he's given them from verses 1 through 10. He said, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 12, Let not sin therefore, in other words, in view of our position in Christ, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Now we know that even when we get saved, the Adamic nature is still with us. Sin remains, but we're to never let it reign. Uh, we, we'll, we'll get rid of the sin nature completely when either the resurrection takes place, Christ comes, or we die. So, notice with me now in verse... Um, 13, he said, Neither yield ye your members, that is, your body, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Those that are saved are spiritually alive from the dead with the Lord Jesus Christ, if we read the verses before it. But notice as we come down to um, uh, verse 16, he says here in verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Notice in verse 18, Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Notice what means we, well, let me read, let me read the next few verses. Verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness, uh, 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 to righteousness unto holiness. Verse 20, 
For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. In other words, you didn't have any righteousness. Then he said in verse 21, he said, What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Now notice verse 22. But now being made free from sin, think about that, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto what? Holiness and the end everlasting life. So we're, we're going to see whether it be Old Testament or New Testament, especially the New Testament, we're going to be told over and over what we have in Christ, who that we are in the Lord, and we're also going to be told how that we can live and be pleasing to God. Notice in chapter 8, in chapter 8, in one verse, I'll read one verse. Notice, and this is repeated again in um, another text, Chapter 8 and verse 13, he said, And if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. So we're called upon as Christians to, uh, to mortify the deeds of the body. What does mortify mean? It means to put to death. Carry the dead to the mortuary, do we not? And put it, put it to death. In other words, don't let it rule and reign our lives. Let the Spirit of God and the Word of God govern our lives and, and lead us. Notice in Romans 13. In Romans 13, I, mean, I, I, I pray that you write the chapters down and go back and read the whole chapters. I'm just kind of grabbing some verses out of their text. I mentioned this to you last week as well in Titus 2, 11 through 14 clearly. He says, the grace that saves you will also teach you to live a righteous life. The same grace that, that, that saves us. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 says we're called unto holiness. And half of that chapter is dealing with sanctification and holiness. And the other half is dealing with the resurrection of the dead. But notice now, as we come here to chapter 13 and verse 14 the last verse of chapter 13. He makes this statement. He said, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. This is what God tells us all as Christians. We are to be sensitive to these things, be to sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Now, I'm going to read three other passages before we close. I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, first of all. In 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter 1, I'm going to read verse 3 and 4, first of all. Then I'm going to read uh, a few other verses. But I want you to notice as I come to these passages, we're going to see, especially when we get in verse 5, 6, and 7, we're going to see that those who are partakers, that is, saved by the grace of God, those who are partakers of the divine nature, they are to add certain things to their faith. In other words, we're talking about our practice, our life. We're, they're to add certain things to their faith. Now notice this. First of all, let's see what we have in Christ. Notice in verse 3 and 4. He said, According as His divine power, that's worthy of highlighting alone, we have a divine power. According to His divine power hath He given unto us all things, as in Ephesians 1, 3, that pertain unto life and godliness, and uh, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us, to glory and virtue. Now that's something to meditate on. He said in verse 4, whereby are given to us exceeding and great, and let me back up, given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Every Christian has 
They're partakers of God's divine nature. They're called a new creature in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and also in Galatians 6. And those that are born again, they're partakers of God's nature. What is that? God's holiness. God's Holy Spirit that abides within each and every one of us. Now, we settle that as we did earlier. That's our position in Jesus Christ. Now let's look at the practical side. Notice verse 5, 6, and 7. Here's seven things that you and I have been called upon and to add to our faith. He said in verse 5, And besides this, give all diligence. In other words, that means to make it your business. Make it your calling, your vocation. Don't let anything hinder it. If we have any hindrances in our life, get rid of it. So he says, and besides this, give all diligence. Add to your faith, and the first thing is virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. That's self-control. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. And you can spend the rest of your life working on that. (laughs) All of us. Every one of us. We can spend the rest of our life adding those things to our faith. That doesn't mean we're saved by it. But this is the practical side Because he actually says this in verse 8. He said, If these things be in you and abound, that is increase, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we add these seven things in our life, he said, you'll always be fruitful. But he says in verse 9, But he that lacketh these things is what? What's the word? But he that lacketh these things is what? Blind. Blind. They're blind. And he says, and cannot see afar off. Now those are nearsighted, spiritually speaking. And he says, and had forgotten that he was purged, that is cleansed from his old sins. So we have again promises here. God said if we'll add these things... To our lives, we will always be fruitful. We will never, ever be unfruitful in our Christian life. Now notice with me as we turn to chapter 3 of 2 Peter. In chapter 3, I want to read, uh, I want to begin reading in verse um, 10. Notice with me in verse 10. He said, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, now watch this, what manner of persons ought you to be in all, what's the next two words? Holy conversations and godliness. In view of His coming, our Christian life, this is where our, our conversations are to always be holy. Notice in verse 12, Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Verse 14. Wherefore, in other words, in view of this new heaven and new earth, in view of all these things, we're we're going to live in righteousness throughout all eternity. He said, Beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of Him in peace, without spot, and blameless. These are wonderful texts, aren't they? They'll help us 
They'll help us to get our priorities right in this life. And then he says in verse 18 that we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and, uh, uh, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now turn to one last passage, and I'm, I'm in, going to be in 1 John in chapter 3. Notice as we come here. So we've just seen in the last two passages that those who are partakers of His divine nation, uh, nature, there's seven things that we're to add to our Christian life. And we also saw in this last passage we just read that those who are saved are to have a holy conversation and godliness. Now notice as we come to First John in chapter 3, and here's where we're going to close at. I think you come, come to the conclusion that we have a positional holiness, and at the same time God wants us to live a holy life. He wants us to get our priorities right, seek Him in our conduct, our conversation, all that we do, that it be centered around the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice I'm going to read the first three verses of 1 John chapter 3. And, and notice the wording. I'm going to focus in on th- verse 3, but notice as we begin in verse 1, again, He tells us who we are before He tells us what to do. He said in verse 1, He said, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Is that not true? The world thinks we're crazy. And we think they're crazy. <laughs> it's a mutual deal, isn't it? And, uh, and so the world don't understand us. They don't understand why you would go to church. They don't understand why you would pray. They don't understand why you will, uh, will uh, love God and read His Word and witness for Him and be faithful to Him. They don't understand that. Because a lost person pretty much lives, even though they're not an animal, they live like an animal. How does an animal live? They live for themselves. They just live to eat and sleep. i got two dogs. You know what they do? They eat and sleep and go to the bathroom. And, uh, and so the average person is lost. This is their life. This is their life. They're just, they just kind of live like an, like an animal. And I'm not criticizing my dogs. I love my dogs. But I'm just saying that uh, there's no uh, spiritual purpose in their life to live. But we have been, we are called as the sons of God. The world don't understand us, and we don't understand the world. We don't under, we do in one sense, but Paul said, I am crucified unto the world, and the world is crucified unto me in Galatians 6 toward the end of that chapter. He goes on to say in verse 2, he said, Beloved, when he says that, you know he's talking to Christians. He said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And if do it not yet appear what we shall be, that is, in resurrection, we know a little bit about it, but these things we don't know, we still see through a glass darkly. We got enough Scriptures to know it's a fact and a few details about it, but we don't understand it all. He said, But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. In other words, in righteousness and holiness. For we shall see Him as He is. And I want to close in verse 3 this morning. And again, if you study this, there's many, many other verses, but these are the ones that I've chose this morning. And I will hope and pray that God chose them. Notice in verse 3, He said, And every man... Now, he's including you sisters as well, okay? And every man that hath this hope in him, that is the hope of eternal life, that has salvation, that's been converted, that's been born again. In other words, that's the starting point. No one can go to heaven 
by their good deeds or their good works or anything they've accomplished. We have to go to heaven through the blood that Jesus Christ shed at Calvary's cross. He's clearly told us in, in Acts 20 and 21, it's repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. We must confess Him as Lord in Romans 10 9. We must believe on Him. We must confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. Because he said that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So salvation, I've been speaking mostly to Christians this morning, but salvation, there has to be salvation before any of this other that we've talked about makes any sense or can be a blessing to you. There has to be salvation. A person has to have the Spirit of God in them. They have to be saved. Jesus said unto Nicodemus, Nicodemus, by the way, is a very religious man. Very religious man. And he came to the Lord and wanted to talk to him about his miracles. But you know what the Lord talked to him about? He said, Nicky, you've got to be born again. Amen. Said it twice. And they said, you, then he said, you've got to be born of the Spirit. He said, you've got to be born again. And you know, as we read through the book of John, we find that's exactly what happened. Nicodemus was born again became a follower of Jesus Christ. But notice in verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him... Oh, look at that next word. I underlined that, highlighted that. I wanted that to jump out to me every time I went to this chapter. Purifieth himself even as he is pure. We have a positional holiness and a practical holiness here in the same verse. Would you stand with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this day. Lord, we thank You for Your love and mercy to us. Lord, we thank You for the blessings that you bestowed upon us, but we mostly thank you for the eternal inheritance that we have. Lord, help us to be holy. Help us to yield to the Spirit of God that lives within us. And Lord, help us to not just read your Word and walk away from it, but Lord, help us to meditate upon it. And Lord, that it, that it just be so meaningful to us. Lord, let us put other books aside and let Your Word be our studies. Lord, I pray if there's one lost among us, Lord, that You'd save them this morning by Your grace and by Your mercy. But Lord, every Christian that is here, help us to be holy because You're holy. Help us to love You. Help, help us to grow in grace. Lord, help us to walk in purity as you have commanded us to do so. And we thank thee in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.